What can the mummy of an ancient bear tell us about? How long was the neck of a titanosaur? And is it true that in prehistoric times worms were several meters long? Watch the episode to the end and you'll know and see everything. Today, I'll show you incredible remains of ancient animals that can change the whole history. Let's go! Mementosaurus Remember this ancient dinosaur's name because it's not every day you hear about a monster which neck was longer than modern buses. This herbivorous giant roamed the Earth about 160 million years ago and looked down at everything. Literally, its neck was more than 50 feet long, with a total size of 72 feet. The first fossils of this wonder of the world were found in 1952 in China. The creature was named after the local group that discovered the remains. In the new analysis of the fossils, paleontologists used computerized topography scanning, which was not widely available decades ago. The scientists wanted to compare this dinosaur with its potential relatives. However, none of the analyses showed any significant similarities. This was a new dinosaur species, distinguished by its massive neck, which no one else had. Along with this, the scientists were able to establish that the bones of this prehistoric creature were hollow, not filled with bone marrow, which is typical of most mammalian bones. The air in them was up to 70% of the total volume, which was apparently necessary for a creature with such an unusual structure. Otherwise, its neck would have simply outweighed it. It remains to be seen what it fed on, how it hunted, and how it used its neck in practice. If you already have some theories about this, be sure to share them in the comments. Titanosaurus If you now think that Mementosaurus is the owner of the largest neck in history, you're wrong. Not so long ago, scientists found the remains of a titanosaur, and as the research showed, its neck was twice as long as the previous dinosaur. Traces of this creature were found in Argentina in 2018. Back then, all the remains were literally scattered around the area. It was as if someone really didn't want the creatures from the future to know about it. One of the main fossils found included seven different bones – femur, metacarpal, humerus, radius, sciatic, tibia, and fibula. These bones were very heavy, as they required at least several people to transport them at the same time. While all this was carefully dug up and transported to more suitable places, five years passed. And now, in 2023, people finally began to study the bones. It turned out that this monster was a herbivorous dinosaur that lived in the middle of the Cretaceous period. It weighed about 40 tons, but most interestingly, it also had a neck about 98 feet long. No one knows why it needed such a big neck. It's believed that in this way it could feed on the fruit at the very top of the trees. But even under these conditions, such large size of the neck is unjustified. A powerful eagle from Australia. To me, it's much better and more effective to be medium-sized but strong and agile. The giant Australian eagle, which remains were found not so long ago, is a perfect example of this. The bird lived about 60,000 years ago, and judging by its analysis, it was the largest eagle in the world. Biologists studied the fossilized bird remains found in Mare's Cave in South Australia and combined the new data with previously discovered bones belonging to these birds from other caves on the continent. During the latest excavations, 28 new bones belonging to fossil eagles were found. Thanks to the discovery, it was even possible to recreate the appearance of these very birds. It's assumed that their wingspan was equal to 10 feet, and their claws could reach 12 inches in length. With their help, this powerful eagle was able to catch even a young kangaroo, grab it by the neck, and carry it into the air. It's hard to believe in such a thing, of course, but you can't dispute the scientific facts. The giant Australian eagle is part of the continent's megafauna. In the past, Australia was inhabited by many large animals, which began to die out in the late Pleistocene. The last representatives of megafauna died after the arrival of the first humans in Australia that is, about 50,000 years ago. Millipede It may seem that humans ruin everything. Even with their arrival, they cause giant animals to die out. But is it really that terrible? Maybe you just haven't seen all the mega-creatures that lived in the past. 
Do you think it'd be cool if there was, for example, a giant millipede walking around on the same planet as us? By giant, I mean so big that it was the size of a small car. People stumbled upon its fossils, quite by accident, in 2018 in the north of England. People found its traces after a large sandstone fragment broke off. Specialists examined the exposed rock and noticed a perfectly preserved fossil, a 29 and a half inch fragment of an ancient millipede. Judging by it, the extinct creature could be about 10 feet long and weigh 110 pounds. Unfortunately for scientists, the found fragment preserved only a print of the shell, exoskeleton, dropped during molting. And molting in these animals occurs during the growth of the body. So in reality, these animals could not only be the largest arthropods in history, but also the largest land animals of the entire Carboniferous period. Tortoises from Madagascar Let's continue the topic of giant creatures and smoothly move on to tortoises. These slow but strong creatures have lived on our planet for a long time. For example, about 1,000 years ago, there were Madagascar tortoises weighing 660 pounds. Scientists are sure they were not ordinary inhabitants of these lands, but one of the most valuable because they were the only herbivores. Scientists are sure that these creatures played the role of the mammoth. But most interestingly, scientists managed to find out about these tortoises thanks to DNA analysis and not animal fossils, as is most often the case. The giants became extinct through no fault of their own. They didn't quarrel with any sort of the locals, but were extremely interesting to people. Their mass capture began, which in a short period of time led to their complete extinction. Modern scientists wanted to restore this species, but it's not easy to do it, to put it mildly. The fact is that almost nothing is known about these tortoises. Even their appearance is difficult for people to restore. The remains don't help much, they're very different, scattered in different places, and do not allow scientists to make a complete picture. Based on the sad news, the goals of the scientists have changed a little, and now they want to at least find out what the ecosystem of the island was like at the time. It wasn't just tortoises that were giants in the past. Many animals were generally much larger than their modern relatives. Rhinos, for example. In 2015, excavations were underway in China, and during them, people came across the remains of some ancient animal. Usually, fossils are broken into separate parts, but this find was a hole, with a very complete skull and a full jaw, which couldn't help but surprise. Soon, the people realized that they were very lucky because they encountered a real ancient giant, a rhinoceros of bygone years. The found giant reached 23 feet in length and could weigh 25 tons, according to scientists 31 million years ago when the Mongolian Plateau dried up, giant rhinos moved south, and when the climate recovered, the mammals returned to the north. Perhaps people have misunderstood something, but either way, this study makes a lot of sense and could change the way we look at history. What changed my personal view of the world was the news that there were giant predatory sea worms in ancient times. Personally, I think that if we're talking about an ancient worm, this creature would be only a couple of inches larger than a modern worm. But what scientists have discovered has shocked the whole world. It turns out that about 400 million years ago, our planet was inhabited by predatory worms which were several meters long. Of course, over such a long period of time and based on the fact that they're worms, their remains were not preserved, but the burrows still did their job. Judging by their shapes and the textures on their walls, the worms were definitely predators and fed on small fish. They hid their huge bodies underground and showed only a small part of their mouths outside. When potential prey swam over them, the worms would quickly grab them and bury themselves completely for a while. It's not known why they became extinct, because if the established date is correct, it means that the worms were strong enough and self-sufficient creatures. And at the same time, perfectly camouflaged from more dangerous predators. The Mystery of Permafrost I suggest we move from too distant antiquity to a less distant one and look at the remains of an interesting female bear, which represents a new bear species. This mummy was found on the Great Lyakovsky Island, which is Yakutia. It's mostly uninhabited, but still there are sometimes reindeer herders and fishing enthusiasts. 
This place is famous for its abundance of tusks and other remains of mammoths. And recently, it's also been known for the discovery of an ancient bear. Finding it was a miracle. Until now, scientists have only gotten the bones of ancient bears. But here, they got a whole, perfectly preserved body with all the soft tissues and internal organs. There are even fur and undercoat. But that's not the most interesting thing. The people assume that they got the already extinct bear species, which is little known to them. However, luck didn't turn away from them at this moment, continuing to bombard the people with interesting news. It turned out that the extinct bears were much larger than modern ones, so even the young mummy found was about five feet long. When the researchers conducted a genetic analysis, they determined that it was not a cave bear at all. The genome turned out to be identical to the DNA of modern brown bears of Yakutia and Chukotka. It turns out that the story was written incorrectly, and the discovered bear species is about 10 times younger than people previously thought. Sea Monster The next, no less mysterious remains were found in Antarctica. People found traces of strange reptiles, so-called plesiosaurs. They were something like huge manatees with giraffe necks and snake heads. They were first mentioned back in 1989. Back then, people found these strange remains, but unfortunately didn't have enough knowledge and technology to retrieve them. Since then, archaeologists have traveled there every year and have been moving towards the discovery step by step. Researchers could only work for a few weeks in January and early February. Some years, no excavation was done at all due to weather conditions or limited resources. In short, the deadlines have been greatly delayed. In the end, the work was only completed in 2017. Paleontologists reported that the creature they found weighed between 12 and 15 tons, and its length from head to tail was about 43 feet. Experts are confident that the individual lived in the Cretaceous period. However, it remains a mystery to this day what it ate and how it hunted. Phytosaur In 2023, a mysterious reptile was unearthed in India. The age of the giant's remains was estimated at over 200 million years old. During the investigation, people pulled out of the ground 27 samples of skull and jaws, as well as about 340 small bone remains. Analysis revealed that not all of them belonged to a single creature. The bones belonged to at least 21 different animals, both very young individuals and teenagers. This suggests that with a high degree of probability, phytosaurs traveled in groups. They hunted together and were able to lead a social life. At the same time, each of their representatives was quite large, which raises new questions. For example, how did they manage to find so much food every day? The collection of remains will still be studied by scientists. There's a chance that the analysis will reveal something new, something that will turn the whole history upside down. And what will definitely turn the history upside down, and possibly end it, is the extinction of all animals. The Situation Now Currently, scientists know more than 1.5 million species of animals. Scientists have described more than 1.3 million arthropods, which are the most common animals in the world. They have also described more than 115,000 species of mollusks and more than 40,000 vertebrates. The figures are quite large, but scientists believe that this is not the limit. Take for example the world ocean. It is very poorly studied. While scientists have done a lot of research at small depth, we can't even talk about great depth. The situation of the deepest places of our planet being poorly studied is evident by the fact that there have been more people on the moon than at a depth of more than 7 to 8 kilometers. It is possible that scientists will still discover many deep sea inhabitants and terrestrial ones as well. The discovery and description of new species continues on all the time. Nevertheless, with all the success of scientists, the situation is not comforting. At this moment, the world is experiencing another era of extinction, which has lasted for several millennia. During this time, many animals, including the famous mammoths, saber-toothed cats, dodo birds, and other animals have already disappeared, and the situation is only getting worse. Swedish scientists estimate that by the end of this century, more than 500 species of mammals will have completely disappeared from the face of the Earth. Many other animals will also become extinct because human activity and climate change are ruthless. It's probably impossible to exterminate absolutely all animals, but let's imagine that it did happen. 
or at least let's imagine that animals began to die out and disappear on their own for unknown reasons. What would happen then? Insects Let's suppose insects were the first to disappear. What would people do in that case? Of course, they'd be happy. After all, now they'd no longer have to swat away mosquitoes, run from vicious wasps and hornets, and be afraid of being bitten by a tick in the woods. The world will forget the existence of malaria, dengue fever, and other dangerous diseases carried by insects. Agricultural workers will breathe a sigh of relief since they'll no longer have to fight Colorado potato beetles and locusts. Even dogs and cats, which are no longer bothered by fleas, will find peace. In general, at first, there will be nothing but happiness, but the consequences will overtake humanity very soon. Insects, for all their small size and pesky nature, are among the most important inhabitants of the Earth because they form food chains in a huge number of habitats and also directly affect plants. Bees, wasps, butterflies, flies, and beetles are the main workers in pollinating plants. About 80% of the world's plants are flowering plants. Consequently, to produce, they need to move pollen from the anther of the stamen to the stigma of the pistil. Sometimes wind, water, birds, and bats can do this, but insects do the lion's share of the work, and no one can replace them. So soon after the extinction of insects, most plants will die. In addition, animals that eat insects will soon starve. Pretty soon they'll all die, and after them, the animals that eat them will die, and so on up the chain. Only the scavengers will remain, but they too will soon run out of food and become extinct. Large Animals and Birds Because large animals and birds will become extinct, there will be no one to produce biological fertilizers. Because of this, the Earth will no longer be fertile enough and plant populations will shrink to an even smaller scale. Due to the absence of fish and other underwater inhabitants, the flora in seas, rivers, and lakes will not receive enough nutrients, which in turn will almost completely destroy all aquatic plant species. Humans While all of this is going on, humanity will already understand the seriousness of the mass extinction of animals. Since I'm talking about the extinction of all animals, over time, people will not be able to eat meat and fish because there will simply be no such products. You can, of course, go vegetarian, but don't forget that the vast majority of plant species will also die and disappear. The diet will be incredibly scarce, leading to mass starvation, as well as to the spread of many diseases that would not exist with meat or normal plant-based diet. The mass extinction of animals will not leave humanity to sole reign over the planet. Humanity is likely to become extinct too, disappearing after the animals. But there are options to avoid it. Future In the first scenario, most of the people of the planet would die. The rest would have to urgently change their diet. In the absence of other living organisms, the planet would take on a completely different, desolate appearance. Most of all, the fertility of the Earth will suffer. Plus, the Earth will suffer the lack of crops, edible plants will be extremely scarce, and humans will eat mostly corn and fir cones, while minerals will be used to maintain the vitamin balance. It's unknown whether humanity will be able to reconstruct its diet and get used to the new circumstances, but even if it can, the Earth will not do without lots of victims. The world will change forever. There's a second option, which is more futuristic. It involves the artificial cultivation of meat in test tubes, as well as the creation of artificial plants. Such technologies already exist. For example, in 2013, the Mosa Meat Company produced the world's first burger from meat grown entirely in laboratory conditions. Since then, the company has improved production techniques and now grows better and cheaper synthetic meat. Many investors see a future in this company and other companies like it, and they're already investing actively. But even if humanity will be able to switch to synthetic products, it will not do without losses. The production of synthetic food on a planetary scale is still out of the question, so most people will still suffer from hunger. So whichever way you look at it, either humanity will disappear along with all the animals, or most of the people on the planet will die, and the rest will have to learn to live in a new world with a meager diet or fake products. As you can see, all the animals, from the smallest insects to the largest predators, are not just our neighbors on Earth, but also something without which we'd be in a very bad situation. After all, everything in this world is interconnected. All in all, a world without animals is a real hell. I hope we never have to go through something like that. By the way, what about us? I think it's clear how the Earth without animals would look like, but what would it look like without us? 
What if all the animals stayed, but all the people disappeared? How would the planet be transformed in this case? Stay tuned. We'll look at that scenario now. First few days. So, there are no more people. No people means no fuel. So, power plants around the world will stop working pretty quickly. The lights will go out all over the world, and the water pumps in the subways which maintain the groundwater level will lose power. So, the underground tunnels will flood quickly. But that's just the beginning. Ten days after the maintenance outage, more than 400 nuclear reactors around the world will go out of emergency mode and, without cooling mechanisms working, will begin to melt and then explode. In many places around the world, the consequences will be comparable to Chernobyl. First Few Months Humanity has been gone for months, so natural disasters will begin to destroy cities. Fires will rapidly destroy wooden structures. Within the next few decades, there will be none left on Earth. Those that do not burn will rot. The lack of heating will cause the rooms to freeze. As a result, many domestic animals will die out. First Few Years People have been gone for years. Moss will gradually take over the deserted roads. Plants will break through cracks in the stone and concrete, and the gradually spreading root system will damage the foundations and some of the block and stone houses will collapse. Glass and metal structures will be the first to suffer, by the way. The former will crack and burst, and the latter will rust and deteriorate over time. The strongest structures will be the stone ones. They're likely to stand for centuries before they're finally swept away by the wind or carried away by the current of the new rivers. After 10 years, methane from the water-filled underground tunnels will begin to escape to the surface and penetrate into the buildings. From time to time, this methane will explode, causing enormous damage to structures that are already failing. Dams around the world will collapse, leading to catastrophic floods. First Few Decades People have been gone for 20 to 30 years. Concrete structures under the influence of plants, cold and wind will begin to deteriorate. High-rise structures will gradually disappear from the urban landscape, including the most famous ones. For example, the Eiffel Tower in the Empire State Building. They'll collapse in about 150 years after humans have disappeared. Having lost power, the Earth's satellites will fall to Earth. Some will burn up in the atmosphere. Others will crash into the Earth, causing numerous fires. Although carbon dioxide emissions will cease with the disappearance of humans, the global temperature will rise by one more degree Celsius within 40 years. At the same time, the Earth's ecosystem will already begin to recover. Centuries Centuries after the disappearance of humans, the northern hemisphere will begin to cool down and cities will be buried under layers of snow. Animals will return to the exclusion zones around the exploded nuclear reactors. By this time, all plastic bags will decompose, vegetation will cover the entire globe as it did 10,000 years ago, and the last materials not decomposed will be radioactive waste, pottery, and bronze. Animals And what about the animals? What will happen to them? Scientists believe that in the absence of humans, they'll take over the world. It's possible that even insects will become a big part of the new ecosystem. Domestic animals will have to survive because they'll have to find their own food. Some of them will die, some will run wild. The cities will be overrun with animals. Lions, bears, and other large animals will go wherever they want because people and electric fences will no longer be able to stop them. In time, the face of the Earth will change completely. Of course, some animals will go extinct. But many survived animals will become rightful kings of the planet, and nothing and no one will stop them. But even if a small group of people remain on Earth, they can once again regain dominance over the planet, because even the most backward aboriginal tribes are able to conquer any beasts, from huge elephants to ferocious lions. Elephant Our distant ancestors hunted mammoths for meat and warm skins. Many centuries have passed, but little has changed in some parts of the world. African pygmies hunt elephants. They're not mammoths, of course, but I'm sure if these furry giants were not extinct, the pygmies would fight them as well. As a rule, they use sharp spears when hunting elephants. They hunt in a group. It's impossible to defeat an elephant alone. The pygmies either drive the elephant away from the herd or track down a lone elephant that's wandered away. While the hunters distract the giant, one of the pygmies sneaks up on it and plunges a spear into its belly or leg. The elephant can then be killed on the spot by throwing sharp spears and stones at it. 
The elephant has to be stabbed with many spears to knock it down, so the fight lasts a long time. Sometimes things can go on for days. The pygmies memorize the wounded elephant, follow it and exhaust it, injuring the legs of the tired giant. After that, they butcher it and the meat is dried or roasted. The pygmies do not cook elephant meat. Buffalo Similarly, African hunters deal with buffaloes. They hide in the thicket and wait for a herd of buffaloes. The main task is to chase one giant away from its herd and try to do it so that the others don't notice the disappearance. After all, buffaloes are very friendly and always try to come to the aid of their congeners. Usually, the aborigines chase away the buffalo running at the end of the herd by throwing spears at them. The throwing technique of the aborigines is honed to perfection, and the spears are incredibly sharp, so with a couple of well-aimed throws they can pierce the giant's skin. And then the same thing happens as with the elephant. The buffalo is stuffed with spears, and when the animal weakens, the hunters come closer and finish it off from a comfortable distance. Elephants and buffaloes are tough prey. These animals are large and quite dangerous, but what about hunting a real predator, like the king of the jungle? In this regard, there is no equal to the Maasai tribe, the aborigines of East Africa. Generally speaking, the Maasai do not hunt lions on purpose. Usually, it comes to hunting when a lion attacks their territory or livestock. The Maasai are very respectful of their livestock, since domestic animals are their breadwinners. Therefore, the aborigines take vicious revenge on each and every one of them. The Maasai hunt in groups and use spears as a weapon, like almost all other aborigines. Warriors may hunt as soon as they see a lion or may hunt after it. Sometimes the Maasai hunt from high ground to keep the lion from climbing up, and sometimes they go straight ahead. The Maasai crowd rushes at the lion and throws spears, screaming. If the lion's alone, it will not do well against such a group. The king of the jungle may try to attack the living wall of natives, but it will be met by spearheads. By the way, the Maasai do not eat game meat, so they hunt lions mainly for revenge. Well, or they can take off its mane, tail, and claws, which will become the ornament of hunters. Snakes Not all Aboriginal people use dangerous weapons when hunting. The Aborigines of the Arula tribe, for example, hunt practically with their bare hands. The more surprising fact is that the main object of their hunting is dangerous, venomous snakes. Members of this Indian tribe hunt reptiles not for their skin or meat, but for the valuable venom which is used in their medicine. As is usually the case, the hunt takes place in groups, although sometimes the Arula people hunt singly. They find the burrow in which the snake lives. Then, using a stick or their hands, the natives widen the entrance to the burrow. Soon the snake gets close to the exit. There's nothing left for it but to get out. And then the natives pick it up and put it in a bag. In one day, the Arula people can catch about 15 venomous snakes. By the way, they catch mostly king cobras, the largest venomous snakes on the planet. Of course, even an experienced master can be bitten by a snake, but in this case the Arula people have an antidote. They make it themselves from dried ground leaves and roots. The Hadza people who live in northern Tanzania hunt in a similar way. The main target of these natives is porcupines. These prickly rodents live in burrows just like snakes, so the principle of Hadza hunting is similar to that of the Arula people. Having found a burrow, the natives first examine it with a stick. If they realize that a porcupine's inside, they widen the burrow and literally get inside. They can hunt with their bare hands or using a short, pointed stick. After a while, an aborigine gets out and a defeated porcupine lies in their hands. However, sometimes the hunter determines the location of the porcupine in the burrow, gets out and makes a second sap so that there's less fuss, so the porcupine can be caught without getting inside again. But why hunt porcupines at all? This animal's prickly and obviously not suitable for eating. But the Hadza people don't think so. They've become adept at butchering these rodents and cooking them over a fire. As they say, hunting porcupines is also smart. It's much more efficient to spend an hour to get the rodent out of its hole than to wait months for the crop to harvest. Although many tribes still hunt animals, this doesn't mean that they all hate animals. Since ancient times, the aborigines of many tribes have literally prayed to certain animals, and some still honor them today. Stay tuned to learn more about the animals that different Aboriginal people consider their deities and patrons. In general, the veneration of animals is called zoolatry or animalism. You all know at least one example of animalism. If you think of cats and the ancient Egyptians, you're right. Cats were revered in Egypt, but not everywhere. For example, the people of Memphis honored the bull. In Edfu and Letopolis, they honored the falcon. But cats were worshipped in Bubastis. Hence the name of the goddess Bast, who is pictured with the head of a cat. Cow As for the present, people of Indian tribes, for example, still venerate the cow. 
Some Aborigines literally worship cows, although the cult of the cow is a feature peculiar to all of India as a whole. The respect that Indians have for these horned creatures is so great that when a cow walks on the roadway, both pedestrians and cars, including police and ambulances, give way to it. Cows walk freely in the streets, and locals feed them when they need the support of a higher power for something important, such as before a surgery or an exam. In addition, cow's milk is considered a particularly pure product and is used in Hindu religious rituals. Snakes Snakes are treated no worse by Indians. Yes, Aborigines like Arula catch them and get their venom, but in general, snakes are an object of reverence in India. This attitude towards these reptiles has its roots in religion. Ancient Indians believed in the Nagas, snake-like mythical creatures with the body of a snake and the head of a human. In honor of the Nagas and their closest relatives, the common snakes, temples were built and continue to be built. Snakes are worshipped on the other side of the earth. For example, since ancient times, the Hopi people have considered snakes as symbols of fertility. The Hopi consider snakes their brothers and rely on them to bring their prayers for rain to the underworld, where the Hopi believe the gods and spirits of their ancestors live. Crocodile Crocodiles, despite all their danger, are revered no worse than snakes. Traditions go back to the distant past. Even in the days of ancient Egypt, crocodiles were sacred animals. The Egyptians worshipped Sobek, the ancient Egyptian god of water and the overflow of the Nile, who was associated with crocodiles. The Egyptians believed that he repelled the forces of darkness and was the protector of gods and people. The tradition still persists. Tribes in West Africa consider crocodiles as gods. For example, the Aborigines, as well as the common people of Mauritania, who live side by side with West African crocodiles, protect and preserve them. This is due to their belief that not only crocodiles need water, but the water itself needs crocodiles. So if they disappear, the water will also disappear. Crocodiles are very much revered in Burkina Faso and Ghana. There are even ponds which are home to sacred crocodiles. For the locals, these reptiles are a kind of lie detector. If someone is suspected of cheating, he or she is asked to go to the edge of the pond. The local natives are sure that the crocodiles will definitely pounce on the liar and won't hurt the honest person. Bear Incredible strength, power, speed, unpredictability. These qualities of the bear have been a source of awe and respect for centuries. No wonder that from ancient times bears were revered by many peoples and tribes. Even in ancient Russia was a kind of cult of the bear. The bear is revered in our time, too. For example, the Evenks, the indigenous people of Siberia, worship bear, calling it grandfather or ancestor. Ethnographers have repeatedly observed the Evenks' bear feasts with round dances, songs, and prayers. Many Indian tribes, as well as peoples living in Alaska, are in awe of bears. For all of them, the bear is, if not a deity, then at least a sacred animal. And that's all, guys. Tell everyone about your favorite animal in the comments. Thanks for watching, and see you later.